Hi, this little video is designed to help you understand how VCE works, um, how study scores are calculated, and ultimately how you get an ATAR at the end of that process. Um, there are actually three videos in this series. Um, the second one goes into a bit of detail about how SACs, um, which are internal school scores, are compared between different schools around the state. And the third one is about how different subject choices and different subject scalings um, affect your ATAR. Um, and the long and the short of it is not very much. Um, this one is aimed primarily at year nines and tens and is about how VCE processes work um, and ultimately how you go from your year 11 and 12 classwork to an ATAR at the end. Um, so in this we'll be covering a few things. We'll be covering what you need to do to complete your VCE, um, how you're going to be graded in each subject of your VCE, and then ultimately how those grades are going to be combined to give you an ATAR, a single score, which um, determines your entry into university, among some other things. Um, so the basics of how VCE work is that you do some work in, in subjects, um, your performance in those subjects are compared to all the other students doing that subject. Um, they're then compared to all the other students who didn't do that subject. So we scale those scores somehow to make sort of more fair comparisons there. And then finally, um, an ATAR, which is where we add up all your scores across all your subjects, um, see where you sit within the overall ranking in the state, and give you what's called a percentile ranking. So that, that's the kind of the structure. Um, and we'll go through what each of those things mean. Uh, but before that, we have to actually get a VCE score. We don't get an ATAR unless we pass the VCE. Um, to get the Victorian Certificate of Education, there's a few rules. Um, you can read those for yourself. I'll give you a few seconds to read them and pause if you need more time. But um, the main thing is you've got to do at least 16 units and you've got to pass English. Um, those units can be your 11 or 12 units. They don't all have to be units 3 and 4. Um, and typically people are going to do um, about 20 or 24 units overall. Um, 10 or 12 of them will be unit 3 and 4. Okay, moving on. Um, the first thing to know is that in grades in year 11, so year 11 level subjects, unit 1 and 2 subjects we call them, um, there's no actual grades that we send to the VCAA. The central body, they don't care whether you got 90% or whether you got 40% or whether you got 20%. All they care about is that your teacher is satisfied that you've met the outcomes of that subject. So if you look at the study design, there's going to be a clear set of things that you need to do to complete that subject, skills that you need to demonstrate. And if your teacher is satisfied that you have, now, usually the way you show that is on a test or on an assessment. Um, but if your teacher's satisfied, they'll send an S to the VCAA. Um, and if they're not, they'll send an N. Um, we'll give you lots of opportunities to show that you have demonstrated those outcomes. Um, but in rare instances, we might send an N to the VCAA. Um, so that's to say that in Unit 1 and 2, the bare minimum is just to show those skills, but really we're just about learning, we're about um, getting grades and so forth, just exactly the same as we would in Year 9 and 10. Um, the grades themselves are count in exactly the same way Year 9 and 10 grades do. Um, now we're going to look at Unit 3 and 4, and the way they're scored is a little bit differently. You really do get a score from the central body, from the VCAA, um, and that score is called a study score for each subject. Okay, so there are two types of assessments in Units 3 and 4. There are SACs and there are your exams. Um, and if you do a design subject, there's also some things called SATs, S-A-T-S, but they work very similarly to SACs, so I'm just treating them as one thing for now. Um, SACs are done in school and are completed um, usually inside class or maybe with a little bit of outside class work, um, and your teacher will monitor your progress along there. Um, sometimes they take the form of tests, sometimes projects, the same as Year 9 and 10 assessments. And then at the end of the year, um, you'll have a set of exams. Um, usually one exam per subject. Maths exams have two, one tech active and one tech free. Um, some subjects, such as uh, theatre studies, might have a performance exam. All those things are called exams. Uh, LOTS have oral exams, um, but they all work the same. You get a score for that exam 
and that score is directly comparable to everybody else in the state because you've all sat the same exam. Um, unlike SACs, you're only those are set by the school and you're only being compared to the students who are in your school. Now video two goes into a lot of detail about exactly how they compare the SAC that you do here at Suzanne Corey versus the SAC that somebody else does down the road at Werribee High. Now, what happens with those scores? So you get a, a total SAC score um, after statistical moderation, which is that process of comparing scores, and you get an exam score, and those two are added together in some sort of weighting. Um, usually that weighting is either two-thirds SACs and one-third exam, or maybe the opposite, vice versa, or somewhere in between. 50-50 uh, is pretty normal. Um, so you get an overall subject score. So let's say this person gets 172 out of 200. They might have got uh, 90 on their SACs and 82 on their exam, both out of 100, and let's say we're 50-50. Um, but that score is not the score that you get. That's not your study score. What they then do is a, a kind of complicated looking thing, but I promise you it's, it's, it's not as complex as it looks. Um, you just have to kind of work through it a little bit slowly. Um, first off, what they do is they compare your score to everybody else who's done that subject. And you get sort of a ranking within the state. You are the uh, 10,314th highest ranked student in the state. Or you are the 458th, or whatever it might be. Um, and so you get that ranking, and then they arrange each person from lowest score all the way up to highest score in this very special shape called a bell curve. Now a bell curve, what it does is it says most people are in the middle. And then there's a few people who are at the very low end and a few people who are at the very high end, but most people are in the middle. Now we see this person uh, sort of 172 out of 200 person, they did pretty well. They, they were pretty high up the rankings on that previous page in the top half, not quite at the very top, but in the top sort of half. So they're getting a score which is above the middle, but, you know, not quite on this full, this tail down here of the very high achievers. Okay? Um, so some of the properties of that is that if you're in that middle bulk group, you get something around 30. The middle score the sort of the person who's right, right smack in the middle of those rankings gets a 30. The person who is sort of a bit above usually gets, you know, mid-30s, a bit below, mid-20s. Um, but 83%, the vast majority of people, get between 20 and 40. And then a small number of people get between 40 and 50, and a small number of people get less than 20. Now, one thing to note is that this is the exact same distribution for every subject. Now I want you to take a moment, just look at this slide, maybe pause it, and really understand what's going on here. Because what this shows is that not many people are getting right up here at this top end. It gets harder and harder, there are less and less people the higher you go. Right? There are very few people who are getting more than 45 in a subject. You really are better off, if you want to maximise your total score, you really are better off getting a lot of sort of 40s, 2s, 38s, that sort of thing, than aiming for like 150. Um, the other thing to note is that the score that you get, even though we say it's out of 50, it's not like a percentage out of 50. People who get a 30 out of 50, they're not getting 60%. They're getting the middle score for all the students who've done the subject. Right? And a student who gets 40, they're not getting 80%. It's actually way more impressive than getting 80% they're getting a score which is better than 91.5% of everybody else who's done the subject. Okay, So a 40 is a really, really good score. Take a Pause the video if you want to sort of get your head around that a little bit more or else we'll move on. Okay, so where you fall on that distribution, where your ranking sits, tells you what study score you're going to get. So in our example, this student might be ahead of 86% of the other students. We count backwards through the distribution to get 86%, and we say, okay, that puts her at a, a 38. Okay, and just remember, it's not a square out of 50, it's a ranking. So, 
I'll say a few things about scaling here, but remember there's a whole video on this. Video three is all about how subjects are scaled. These scores here in this column here, these are what we call, we usually referred to as your raw scores. Officially they're called VCAA study scores, but you'll hear people call them raw scores. Um, they're the score that you get from that distribution. They're saying, you know, if you get a 30, you're right in the middle. If you get a 40, you're above 91.5%. Um, if you get a 20, you're below 91.5%, and so on. Right. But if we think about it, I think on some level we all know that it's harder to be the middle student in specialist maths than in most other subjects. All the people who do specialist maths are really good at maths, or nearly all of them. So to be the middle in that group of geniuses is pretty impressive. So we have to account for that somehow. And the way we account for it is through scaling. So we look at what is that 30 in specialists really are worth? What is, it, what is it worth compared to the other subjects? And there's a whole big process for working that out, and there's a whole video on that. But we get in what's called an ATAR scaled score, an ATAR study score. Um, and that's usually just referred to as your scaled score. Um, and those are the numbers that actually go into your ATAR, not the raw scores. So once we've got those ATAR scaled scores, all we do is we add up the top four. So in this case, that would be theatre studies, psychology, physics, and English. And English actually has to be in there regardless of whether it's in the top four. So no matter what, English is going to count in your top four. And then what we do is we take 10% of the next two best. So usually most people only do six subjects, so that's just 10% of the other two. But if you've done a seventh or an eighth even, hopefully not an eighth, uh, we, they'll be disregarded entirely. So we only take 10% of the next two. That can also include things like special vet courses or higher education studies that you've done that might contribute an extra little 10% there. Okay, so we would be taking the full load of physics, English, theatre studies and psychology and we'd be taking 10%, so 3.9 and 3.7, from ancient history and maths methods. We add those scores together and we get an aggregate score. So usually somewhere around the sort of high hundreds, 180, 190 maybe. Um, if you've done amazingly well, maybe into the 200s, but you know, that's 450s. I don't think anybody is um, expecting that. Um, and we take that total score and we put that in another ranking. If we look at this distribution here, let's say there's only 12 students in the state. Um, our student is the third best, but we don't actually count from the top, we count from the bottom. We say, how many students have you done better than? You've done better than one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine students out of 12. So you get an ATAR of 75.0. 75% of students have not done as well as you, so you get an ATAR of 75. Um, that's why we don't have ATARs of 100. If we had ATARs of 100, we'd be saying you've done better than everybody in the state, including yourself, which is impossible. Um, so a 99.95 is the very highest ATAR that they give out. They also round this off to the nearest 0.05 because they don't want people arguing over the last 0.01% of a mark. Okay, and that's a lot. That's how you get from classwork to an ATAR. Um, if you would like some more information on exactly how that scaling works, then watch video three. And if you'd like some more information on exactly how they get your study score from your SAC scores, um, when you're doing completely different work in completely different schools, then that's going to be covered in video two. Thanks for listening.